Now, now the, the best government, the best form of government is not what we have in America. I know that's probably what you were taught in, you know, civics class in school. But the problem with what we have now, which was originally called a republic, is that you can't keep it. That sooner or later, people will come to the foreground who will take the reins of control. It, it, there's a saying, uh, nature abhors a vacuum of power. If there's a, a, an entity where power is not being exercised, then somebody who feels powerful will take the reins of control there. But the best form of government is what is called a benevolent monarchy. A be uh, it's a king. It, it's a, a king who rules justly, who rules in righteousness. You know, there was, really, that, they haven't, history hasn't had very many of those. There was one in, in Czechoslovakia back in the 900s, a guy named Wenceslas. You know, there was a Christmas song. We say, good King Wenceslas, look down on the feast of Stephen. He didn't last very long because his brother Boleslas assassinated him. That, that's, don't it always seem to go? Well, this world is going to have a benevolent king. His name is Jesus, and he is coming soon. But here's, the, here's an even better bit of information. You get to reign with him as his followers. If you follow the lamb wherever he goes, you get to, to be part of that kingdom. That's what we're going to talk about today, about, about being a kingly priest. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. It says you, and it's speaking to the body of Christ, okay? You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased special people, that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people at all, but now you are God's people. Once you were unpitied, but now you are pitied and you have received mercy. We are a kingly priesthood. Go to Psalm 110. You've heard this before if you've been to Romans 8 for very long. The Lord God says to my Lord the Messiah, sit at my right hand until I make your adversaries your footstool. Well, God, as we understand, is sitting on a throne, right? So we're talking about the right hand of God being another uh, place of rulership, another place of authority. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole thing about the Trinity, about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and how they really all three are one. But let's understand that Jesus came to earth as a, as a man, just like us. It says that, that, that he was tempted in all ways as we are, but he did not sin. He had flesh. He had blood. 
When he was crucified, his blood was poured out as the sacrifice for our sin. But he is still in human form. He's not a spirit. You know, he said, handle me. I'm not a ghost. I'm not a spirit. Okay, so. Now, God, the Father, is a spirit. God, the Father, does not have flesh and bone like you do. I'm not sure I can even conceive of what that would be. I mean, I can conceive of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit talks to us. The Holy Spirit reveals truth. The Holy Spirit gives us warning. You know, He walks with me and talks with me, right? Okay, but, but God is, is so infinitely above all that we ask or think, I'm not sure I could do justice to try to explain the fatherhood of God. But he, he rules. He reigns. Now, of course, the Calvinists would say, well, yeah, so nothing happens unless he ordains it. No, that's not true. We've, we've gone over that many times. Steve went over some of that on Friday night. So I'm not going that direction with this either. But he's sitting on his throne. Jesus now is sitting on his throne. It says, after he rose from the dead, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And there he is making intercession for us. He's praying for us. We're going to talk how that intercession of Jesus fits into his government and how that has to do with us being priests as well as kings. Okay, let me keep reading. Verse 2, the Lord will send forth from Zion the scepter of your strength. Rule then in the midst of your foes. Your people will offer themselves willingly in the day of your power. In the beauty of holiness and in holy array out of the womb of the morning to you will spring forth your young men who are as the dew. Now, I will have some more to say about that in verse 3 and other messages that are going to be coming forth in this series. See, I'm doing a series now about spiritual preparation. And the first three parts, I told you, look, they're doable. Really, all of this is doable. It's not that you have to be some specially talented or specially endowed person to do any of this. Anybody can be this. But the first three parts were, were kind of, okay, like public school will say, okay? To you be yourself. Don't try to be somebody else. And the second part was, was resist evil. There is evil out there. You know, you've got to do right and don't do wrong, okay? And then... Uh, last Sunday I talked about you being an active listener. Stay awake. Pay attention to God because there's a lot of stuff trying to distract you. But then on Wednesday, I made the point that, okay, you can even move up a, a, a level from that. You, you can be a Berean. And you have a choice in whether you're going to be a Berean or not. Really, you have a choice in all of that. But being a Berean is a notch above just being saved. I don't mean that you can enhance your salvation by saying that, but you certainly can enhance your understanding of the things of God by studying to show yourself approved. Right? Nobody argues with that. Okay? The measure of thought and study that you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you. And more besides... But see, you have a part in that. But now, we're going to go up a notch beyond that. I mean, if, if being a Berean was like going to college, well, this is like going to grad school. Or if you want to take another, you know, if you're in, in a trade, okay, it, it, you know, the first level is like you're an apprentice. You're learning, you're learning the ropes. Then the next level, being a Berean, would be a journeyman, okay? Now we're talking about being a master electrician or a master carpenter or whatever. Or if you want to put it in the military, you know, it's like, the, you know, you can enlist and be a, you know, a, an enlisted man for your two years or four years or whatever it is. Or then you can go to officer candidate school and, you know, be the next level. But then there are those that are the joint chiefs of staff. 
Okay? God wants us to be joint chiefs of staff. He says he wants us to rule and reign with him. I'm not going to give you all the scriptures in the New Testament where it says that, but we'll get to a few today. But this business about ruling and reigning with him, this is not just Jesus and the rest of us are just sinners saved by grace and we're all peons. Verse 4, The Lord has sworn and will not revoke or change it. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So rulership involves priesthood. Well, let's talk about priesthood then because we need to know what that entails. Hebrews chapter 5. Verse 1. Now Israel had a priesthood. The Catholic Church has a priesthood. Satan worship has a priesthood. Pagan religions have a priesthood. So, the priesthood then would be an elite cadre uh, of those who are promoting uh, and ruling over whatever the entity is. Now, in Hebrews 5, it's talking about the priest under the Old Covenant, the Levitical priesthood. Now remember, the, the priesthood that, that Jesus represents and that's bestowed upon us is not the Levitical priesthood. I'll give you that in a minute. Ours is a Melchizedek priesthood. And that's, that's considerably different, but we'll get to that in a minute. Every priest, so just priests in general, even if we're not talking about Christianity, and here it's talking about Judaism, every priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in things relating to God. Now this is important because as a priest, you are a representative of your deity. You know, you've heard the saying, sometimes you're the only Jesus somebody out there will see. You know, and if we, if we really took that to heart, we'd probably live a little differently than we do. But like that we are maybe the only Bible some people will read. <laughs> that's a priest. That's, that's being um, acting on behalf of God to humanity around you. To offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. Well, what's a sacrifice? It's something that... <laughs> You, it doesn't necessarily make you happy, but, but you do it because it's right. I mean, brushing your teeth can be a sacrifice. You know, <laughs> after a meal, it's like, oh, I don't want to take the time to go in there to the bathroom and put that stuff on, on that brush and run it across my mouth. It's like, I'm too busy. But it's like you do it because, because you know it's the right thing to do. Well, that's a sacrifice. A sacrifice is something you do because it's the right thing to do and not because you want to do it. Now, if you want to do it, that's fine. I mean, okay, uh, I, I, like, I, I want to run, so I go out and run. But it's, it's a sacrifice to, for me to stay healthy, okay? All right? An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, you know, you might not like apples. <laughs> but if you know that it's got selenium and zinc and a bunch of good stuff, you'll go ahead and eat it anyway, right? Yeah, Pat's back there shaking her head. Yeah, she knows what I'm talking about. Okay. That's a sacrifice. So, so praying for people who are sinning, especially if they're sinning against you, is a sacrifice. Okay? And it says that the, the priest is able to exercise gentleness and forbearance toward the ignorant and the erring since he himself is also liable to moral weakness and physical infirmity. And because of this... He is obliged to act, offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as those of the people. 
Okay, verse um, 7. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered definite special petitions and supplication with strong crying and tears to him who was able to save him out of death, and he was heard because of his reverence toward God. Now, you may have heard it said that God doesn't respond to the urgency of your request. He responds to the faith that you show in that request. That's not entirely true. Because if that were entirely true, then why did Jesus offer urgent prayer with strong crying and tears? You think God doesn't pay attention to that? You, you think, oh, oh no, I'm not going to listen to that because there's not enough faith in that. No, God is not like that. Yes, you do need, I mean, it does say in James, say if you're going to offer a prayer, you need to believe that God has heard you because otherwise you're going to get battered around by the devil. But that's a problem. That's your problem. That's not God's problem. God doesn't have a problem hearing your prayer. You know, you go to Daniel. You go to the ninth chapter of Daniel. He was doing this. I mean, he was, he was upset because of the state of his people. So if we're upset about the state of America, what, what, did, the, what did the angel say to Daniel? He said, hey, I heard you. I heard your prayer. Actually, I think it was Daniel 10 where, he, where it said this. That, that, yeah, I heard your prayer, but these demonic forces were interfering with me coming to you to give you the answer. Well, there's demonic forces interfering with us getting the answers to what we're praying about. At all levels of this, not just what we're praying about America, but what we're praying about everything that concerns us. So that's why you need to be sure that you, you ratchet your faith up when you're praying. But I'm, I'm not telling you that, oh, God's not going to hear your prayer if there's, there's a lot of crying and tears with it. He heard Jesus when he did that. Sometimes the only prayer I can pray is, Lord, help my unbelief. You know what? I would have to believe that God hears that prayer. Because if he didn't, I don't know why I'm standing here. <laughs> I wouldn't be standing here if God hadn't heard that prayer umpteen times. Okay. But we're a different order of priesthood. Go to Hebrews chapter 7. And Jesus was a different order of priesthood. Because Jesus was not a Levite. And the tribe of Levi was the priests under the Old Covenant. So, well, did God just slip up there and put, have Jesus born into the wrong, wrong family? No. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. It says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham as he returned from the slaughter of the kings, and he blessed him. Well, let me remind you, Abraham was before Moses. Abraham was before Isaac. Abraham was before Jacob. Abraham was before all of Jacob's sons, one of whom was Levi. So, priesthood then does not have to be confined to a particular organizational hierarchy. In the body of Christ in America, priesthood has to adhere to denominational affiliation generally. In fact, same thing in, the, in Czech Republic. Um, <clears throat> when Ellen and I went over there to Bobby Tomonic's wedding back 20 years ago, it was said that uh, the, the, the man who was ministering in that church, he had to uh, align himself with a denomination, even though he didn't have any contact with that denomination at all. But he had to get some papers from them to show that he was uh, an official minister. Otherwise, the government of the Czech Republic would not allow him to conduct public services and, and to collect money and to do what a church does. I have a little piece of paper somewhere. I'm not even sure it's in here. I, I don't know where it is, really. 
that was signed by Owen Cain saying, I'm ordained to stand here and do this. <laughs> okay, but you know what? You don't have to listen to me because of that. And suppose I didn't. Would you quit listening to me? Well, a lot of Christians out there feel like, okay, if you hadn't been to the seminary and you aren't, you know, you don't have a, a you know, a degree or a, or a license from that denomination, then, then you're not qualified to preach. I'm glad we don't look at it that way. Okay. But the, the Melchizedek priesthood was outside of the hierarchy. It, subs, it, it uh, went beyond hierarchy here. For Abraham gave to him a tenth portion of all the spoil. And he is primarily, as his name when translated indicates, king of righteousness. We've got some more to say about that in a minute. And also king of Salem, which means king of peace. Without record of father or mother or ancestral line, neither with beginning of days or ending of life. Hmm. Didn't die. Resembling the Son of God, and he continues to be a priest without interruption and without successor. Now, I'm not going to comment on whether this was a type and shadow, whether this was a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus, or if this is some other person like Enoch. I mean, all those theories are out there of who exactly Melchizedek was. That's really not the point. The point is, we have a priesthood like his. And what does that entail? Go to verse 13. For the one whom these things are said belonged not to the priestly line uh, and belongs to a tribe no member of which has officiated at the altar. For it's obvious that our Lord Jesus sprang from the tribe of Judah. And Moses mentioned nothing about priest in connection with that tribe. And this becomes more plainly apparent when another priest arises. Another priest other than Jesus? Hmm. When another priest arises who bears the likeness of Melchizedek. Well, what's the, what's the likeness of Melchizedek? I'm so glad you asked because it's going to tell you in the next verse who has been constituted a priest not on the basis of a bodily legal requirement. He doesn't have to have a seminary degree. He doesn't have to be a good speaker. He doesn't have to have a commanding pr uh, personality. That's a bodily, all those are bodily things. They're physical characteristics. And let me say, in this world, somebody who has those physical characteristics, people follow right in line with them wherever they go. They can be preaching error, and people, oh, he, you know, he speaks with the power of God. They can do miracles. Oh, that's the power of God. It might not be the power of God. Who was constituted a priest not on the basis of a bodily legal requirement, an externally imposed command, but on the basis of the power of an endless and indestructible life. We can have that. Jesus said, if you believe in me, you will not die at all. You know, he said that to, to uh, Martha. Martha. Well, let's talk about this ruling thing. Go to Isaiah chapter 9. Hey, you know, this sounds all real wonderful. But God intends for us to have the goods. He intends for this not just to be religious rhetoric. He intends for us to actually walk in this and live in this, for it to be a functional reality, an existential truth in our lives. Because it's going to be in this world when Jesus comes back. Jesus is coming back to a real world to rule over it. Now, there's a lot of debate among prophecy teachers about 
when exactly that refers to and what exactly it is. Uh, Steve has been talking about this on Friday night, and he probably has some more to say about it. But here's what the Bible has to say about it. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. <clears throat> the people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwelt in the land of intense darkness and in the shadow of death, upon them the light has shined. And you will read in the gospel where that verse is quoted uh, as prophesying Jesus is coming to Galilee and his ministry back 2,000 years ago. But you know what? Those people in Galilee 2,000 years ago are not the only people that have walked in darkness. I mean, all of us have walked in darkness before we came to Jesus. <clears throat> so it could refer to his first coming. And in a sense, we could say that we are still in the um, afterglow of his first coming. But starting in verse 3, you're seeing things that did not happen back then. And that, okay, you could kind of twist reality enough to say, well, yes, it, it did happen back then or it's happening now. But in terms of real, functional, physical reality, it's not happening yet. It says, you have multiplied the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you like the joy in harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of Israel's burden and the staff or rod goading his shoulders, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken in the day of Midian. Well, tell that to those Israelis over there right now, surrounded by their enemies. This hasn't happened yet. For every trampling warrior's boots and all of his armor in the battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood shall be burned for fuel for the fire. Now that hadn't happened yet either. In fact, it won't happen, uh, Ezekiel 39 says, until after the battle of Armageddon and it's going to take them, what, seven months or whatever to clean all of that up? So this is end time prophecy here. But let's keep reading. For... To us a child is born, this is Jesus, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Here's your benevolent monarchy. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace there shall be no end. That's something else we haven't seen in this world. Governments don't keep building and building and getting better and better. They all go into decline and they run out of money and they run out of power and they fall apart. Jesus' kingdom isn't going to do that. Of peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from the latter time forth even forever and the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. Now, this mention of the throne of David, it has a literal fulfillment in that Jesus is actually, through his mother, a descendant of King David. And there were promises that God made to King David that his, his throne would last forever. But then after, you know, back there in Old Testament times, that kind of got destroyed. I mean, after the, the, they were carried away captive to Babylon, I don't think they know really who, who David's descendants would be other than those that have kept genealogical records as far as, you know, the, the, the line of succession... And even if they did, <clears throat> after Israel came under the Babylonians and then under the Persians and then under the Greeks and then under the Romans, and then you go later, then they came under the, the, uh, the Turks and under the, you know, the Ottomans and under the British Empire, and now they're under the, what, the, the global elite. Uh, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu's probably not a descendant of King David, 
or whoever, whatever the guy is that's over there ruling now. I mean, th they don't even talk about stuff like that. In fact, probably 70-something percent of all people living in Israel are atheists. You know, this would be just a historical thing for them. This is not a spiritual guidebook. Now, they might want to know what it says so they can make their plans for how, how they're going to prepare for the future. But what does he mean then about the, the, the throne of David and ruling with justice and ruling with righteousness? <coughs> well, go to Isaiah chapter 22. Verse, well, let's, let's get the context of this. Let's look at verse 12. It says, In that day, the Lord God of hosts <coughs> will call you to weeping and mourning, to shaving off all the hair in humiliation and the girding of sackcloth. But instead, see... There's pleasure and mirth, slaying of oxen, killing sheep, eating flesh, drinking wine, and saying, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Well, right there pretty well describes the mind control, the, the being asleep uh, of the population of the world in our day. I mean, it, it described the way Israel was right before they were overrun by the conquerors. But, you know, 1 Thessalonians 5 says, let's don't sleep like the rest do. Well, the rest are there. The rest saying, hey, you know, tomorrow this may all come crashing down, so let's have our fun while we can, you know. Let's spend all of our kids' inheritance right now while the money's still flowing, right? So, then in verse 20... It says, and in that day I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe, and that robe was Shebna, the, the, the servant, who was wicked, who was looking to, to, you know, grab all he could while he could and stow it away. He said, I will bind El Eliakim with Shebna's robe, will bind his girdle on Eliakim and will commit his authority into Eliakim's hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David I will lay upon his shoulder. He shall open and no one shall shut. He shall shut and no one shall open. And I will fasten him like a peg or nail in a firm place and he will become a throne of honor and glory to his father's house. And they shall hang on him the honor and the whole weight or the whole responsibility for his father's house. The offspring and issue of every family, every small vessel from the cups to the flasks to the big bulging bottles. Now, right here you're seeing what being a kingly priest entails. In one word, responsibility. You know, if we say, okay, I, wanna, I, want, that, I want that authority. I want to use the authority of Jesus in the name of Jesus. And we've been trained to do this. We've been trained to bind the devil, right? You, you, if, if there's a storm coming, if you're sick, or if there's... Uh, an accident or a, a financial problem. You've been trained to use the name of Jesus. That's the devil doing that to you and you come against it with the name of Jesus. You, you bind it, right? Matthew chapter 16, let's read it. Now, there in Isaiah, Isaiah referred to it as the key of the house of David. Jesus refers to it as a key to his kingdom. Because his kingdom is the kingdom of David. Right? Matthew 16, let's start at verse 15. 
Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus answered him, well, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the powers of the infernal region, shall not overpower it, or be strong to its detriment, or hold out against it. Now, let me say, just because Jesus promised something doesn't mean, okay, it's going to happen regardless of what you do. It's like, well, he said, you know, God is sovereign, so if he said it, bingo, it happens. Well, you got a part in that, right? He gave, he gave us authority, but if we don't use it, the gates of hell do prevail against us. Have you noticed you know, this is, this is a question that arises. People say, well, well then, uh, you know, if I bound the devil, then how come, how come these problems still exist? If I, if I bound, uh, you know, uh, the government lying, then how come they're still lying? Or if I bound this attack from the devil, how come this thing is still going on? There is another level of using authority, is what I'm saying. We have to be kingly priests. And the, the bigger the issue is, the more you need that kingly priesthood authority to come against that thing. You know, if, you, if, you're, if there's somebody uh, doing something you don't like and say, well, I'll bind that in Jesus' name, that probably is not going to be sufficient to take care of that problem. Because a lot of times those problems are big and they're complex. And certainly, you say, well, I prayed for America. You know, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I'll heal their land. Well, Lord, how come you had not healed our land? Because you're not functioning as a kingly priest. <laughs> you know, you are you're trying to do that, and hey, bless you. That, you got to start somewhere. Okay, bind that stuff. Bind it 70 times a day. But that's still not going to be enough. That's still not going to going to change the, the winds of uh, the you know political agitations that are in this world. That's something huge. That's something we've got to have a higher level of kingly authority and priesthood in order to to stand against. But let me tell you, if you are walking in that then all of them can confront you to your face and, and say, we're going to kill you. And you can stand and say, no, you're not. You know, it, it, like, like Elijah did. He said, well, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to haul you to, to Guantanamo and we're going to, you know, cut your head off. And you say, well, and you say, well no, maybe fire's going to come down from heaven and destroy you. And it did. But see, that's, a, that's the kingly authority. And I don't know about you, but I'm not really quite there yet with that. But it's available to us. That's what he said. The gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Jesus has said, it, it can be. Well, then, then why, where's the problem then? How come it ain't working so great? Well, the problem is, is we haven't really been priestly in our, in our exercise of authority. And not only that, it says in verse 19, it says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom, but whatever you declare improper and, unlaw and unlawful must be what is improper and unlawful in heaven. That requires revelation. That requires discernment. It requires understanding. It requires you being a good Berean. In other words, if you're not a good Berean, uh, Matthew 16, 19, and Luke 18, and, and Matthew 18, 18, and Luke 10, 19, all the scriptures we use to bind the devil, if you're not a good Berean, it ain't going to work very well for you because you're not really going to be doing it with accurate knowledge. You're going to be doing it according to your perceptions and your feelings, and that's not good enough. It must be what is bound in heaven, and whatever you loose or declare lawful on earth must be what is loosed in heaven. 
And that means we might think, oh yeah, uh, Donald Trump is God's man and he's going he's gonna to save America. Well, we're loosing, Don we're, you know, we're, we're, we're saying, oh yeah, I approve of this. Is that really the last word on that subject? Just because you feel like it is? Just because he appeals to you because you're a, a white Christian in America? Well, look, the other side does the same thing. You know, if, if, you, if you like gay marriage and you, you think, you know, women should be able to have an abortion anytime they want to, and, and if you're black, you've been oppressed, and so the government owes you something or other. You know, the politicians will tell all of them something to get their vote, and then when those politicians get in, they're running toward the new world order just like the Republicans are. They're taking advantage of the, of, the Democrat, of the blue clientele just like the Republicans are taking advantage of the red clientele. And it's all going the same place. The fasci. Isaiah 32. It's us. God wants us to rule. <clears throat> Behold, verse 1, a king will reign in righteousness and princes will rule with justice. Now, in, in a card game, you know, you have the king and then you have the queen and then you have the jack. So, we tend to think of kings and princes according to card games. But actually, Etymologically, according to the meanings of the words, it's talking about apples and oranges. King, kingdom and, and prince are actually two different concepts. <clears throat> a king, the, the, the word in Greek is basileus, and it has to do with the basis uh, of, the, of the kingdom. It, it has to do with what the kingdom is based on. You know, it's like that Roman centurion that, that came to Jesus and he said, hey, all you need to do is just speak the word. He said, because I understand authority. He said, I have authority. I can command people to do this and that and they obey me. Because he was standing on the basis of the authority of the Roman government. So a king rules on the basis of the authority of his kingdom. Jesus is, is not ruling because, oh, I, look, at, look at everything I did. I healed all these people and I fed thousands and, hey, they crucified me, but I rose from the dead, so, so I deserve to be king. He's not saying that. He's saying, I represent the ruler of the universe and I'm here to do his bidding and so that is my basis of kingship. Now, prince is a whole different concept. You know, the word principle, like the principle of a school, you know, that principal of school can't just do what he jolly well pleases. Or, or if he does, he gets called before the school board and he gets called before, you know, the PTA and, and other people. Prince simply means you're the, the, you're the one driving the bus. You're the one responsible. You're, you're the one, the principal, uh, you know, P-R-I-N-C-I-P-A-L. You're the, you're the visible representative of whatever. Okay? We are that. We're God's hands and feet on this planet right now. And even when he comes back, he's going to charge those who rule with him to, to go do stuff. You know, he might send you to Alaska or he might send you to South Africa or whatever. I mean, if you're a prince, see, that was what he created Adam and Eve to be. What He says, uh, you know, he made them in his image and he said, uh, Take dominion over the earth. Now, a lot of Christians right now think they can do that right now, in, in, but who are they representing? Are they really representing Jesus or are they representing a political party? Or are they just representing their own desires? A prince is not going to do that. A king will reign in righteousness and princes will rule with justice. Let's talk about justice a moment. Micah 6, 8 says, God has showed us what's good. And what is it? Three things. To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. That's why I say you don't generally find 
all three of those characteristics in earthly rulership. There's a slogan that says, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. You know, that, that if somebody gets powerful enough, you cross them and they're not going to be merciful with you. Okay, and justice, what is that? Well, the word justice, actually, in both Greek and Hebrew, is tied with the word right. You know, what is right? What is correct? What is true? What, not just, okay, tit for tat, or, you know, uh, I get my revenge. You did this, so I do that. That's, our con that's a human concept of justice. And see, that just goes on forever. I mean, you know, this one offends that that person, so that person gets back, and it's just a constant, you know, back and forth. That ain't justice. Justice is what's right. And each one of them, verse 2, shall be like a hiding place from the wind, from the storm, like streams of water in a dry place. Hmm. This sounds like uh, the wilderness, doesn't it? Like shade of a great rock in a weary land. This sounds like what Isaiah chapter 4 talks about. And then the eyes of those who see will not be closed or dimmed, or the ears of those who hear will listen. And the mind of the rash will understand knowledge. Ah, I claim that one. And have good judgment. And the tongue of the stammerers will speak plainly. And the fool will no longer be called noble, See, we talked about noble, nobility on Wednesday. And it's not just being, uh, you know, uppity. It's not just being affluent. Nor the crafty or greedy said to be bountiful or princely. Okay, 2 Samuel chapter 23. Talking about the kingdom of David, this is what David had to say to his heirs, to those who would come after him. So this would apply especially to Solomon. This would apply again by extension to Jesus. And as part of his kingdom, this would apply to us. 2 Samuel 23, verse 3. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, When one rules over men righteously, that's doing justly, loving mercy, and ruling in the fear of God, that's walking humbly with God, God dawns on them like the morning light when the sun rises on a cloudless morning, when the tender grass springs out of the earth through a clear shining after the rain. See, that's what was talked about over there in Psalm 110, verse 3. And then David says, But truly, does not my house stand so with God? There's other translations that say, uh, my house isn't standing that way with God, at least right now. But don't give up. It says, for he has made an everlasting covenant and ordered all things and sure. And for will he not cause to prosper all my help and desire? But the wicked and godless and worthless lives are like thorns to be thrust away because they cannot be taken with the hand. But the man who touches them must arm himself with iron and the shaft of a spear, for they are utterly consumed with fire on the spot. There's end time prophecy in here, and we may unpack this a little bit more 
as we go forward. But suffice it to say, we are on the precipice of all of this coming to pass. We can, we can be those who rule in the fear of the Lord. <clears throat> you know, it says in Malachi that those who love the Lord talked often one with another. And God remembered it and put it in a book and he says, they'll be my jewels. They'll shine. And in that time, the wicked are going to be burned up. Now, I'm not in a big hurry to see that happen in our world today. And I'm not saying God is in a big hurry to, to burn people. But that is, that is slated to happen. And, and we might as well just, just put that on your calendar. <laughs> okay? You might as well not be hoping, oh, well, we'll turn this thing around and, and there'll be a thousand years of, you know, we'll just go, you know, that whole end time scenario, all oh, that's not going to happen. That doesn't have to happen. See, there's a lot of Christians, I think, that think that just because that's in the Bible doesn't mean that it has to happen. Well, it doesn't mean God wants it to happen, but he does know the end from the beginning. And why would he tell us this if it wasn't going to happen? He's warning us. That's right. He wants us to know. Right. And if you know this, you are being prepared to rule with Jesus. That's what I have to say to you today. So, God, underscore that. Make that, to, make that real to everybody hearing this message. That they can rule and reign with you. Right. And now, Father, prepare our hearts to receive the emblems.